Hi everyone, Greg Meskel here with you at the Olympic Club in San Francisco and it won't be long before this room behind me is jam-packed with members of the water polo community here to honor the best in the college game. After two years away, we're so excited to be back on site at the Olympic Club with a packed house to cheer on six amazing finalists and find out who our two winners will be, adding their name to this trophy in the history of college water polo. Now, if you're new to the Catino Awards, you're wondering, how does this thing get decided? Who wins? Let's fill you in. For starters, it's like awards you know from other sports. The Heisman Trophy in football, Hobie Baker in hockey, Herman Award in soccer. That's what the Catino Award is. It recognizes the very best in college water polo. So how do we decide who wins the Catino Award? It's a pretty simple formula. The coaches vote in the gender that they coach, and then past winners cast a vote. After that, we find out who will add their name to the Catino Award trophy. So by the end of tonight, two deserving athletes will add their names to this historic trophy. They'll join some amazing company. We're talking about true water polo royalty. Names you know from the college game that have gone on to excel at the Olympic level. Our first winners and Olympians, Bernas Orwig for the women, Sean Kern for the men. How about Tony Azevedo? Look closely, you'll see his name four times on this trophy. He's the only person to ever win it four times in a row. The list goes on. Brenda Villa, Natalie Golda, Courtney Matthewson. How about some of our two-time winners on the men's side? J.W. Krumpholtz for USC, Balash Erday for Pacific. Stanford ran off five straight winners in a row in the early 2010s. And then you have people like Ben Halleck still dominating for Team USA, a two-time winner for Stanford. Mackenzie Fisher, a finalist this year, already a winner. It is all part of the rich history of college water polo's greatest honor, the Catino Award. This is the room where it happens in the world of college water polo. We bring you inside the Olympic Club, and it won't be long before all the tables and chairs behind me are jam-packed with members of the water polo community excited to celebrate the best in the college game. But before we move forward, we always like to pay respect to our history here in the college game and at the Catino Awards as we chat with a past recipient of College Water Polo's highest honor. Here was one of the all-time legends in the game, a four-time Catino Award winner, Tony Azevedo, stopping by. Tony, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. When, when you think back to that, that time at Stanford and you know, the run that you and the Cardinal were able to put together and what you did individually, what's, what's some of the first things that come to mind? First off, you go into college just, just trying to you know, survive, trying to get good grades, trying to, 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 to bond with your team and mesh. And after that, it's what does it take to win, right? Um, and that's one of the things that I loved when the awards came out and what the meaning behind the Catino Award is. That's what that award's about, right? There's always a scoring leader. There's something else later on. But to me, that, that, that's where my mindset was. It was coming in. It was, hey, okay, I want to do whatever it takes for my team to win. We had some great players like Peter Hudna, Jeff Nesmith, um, and then Dante was the coach, and then Vargas was my first coach. So those two on the first two championships, uh, winning with two different Olympic coaches was pretty awesome. How were you different from the, the first-year player that won that honor to the last-year player that won that honor? Did your, did your game change? Do you feel like you – you adapted in certain ways or got better in certain ways? Did I get better for sure, right? The, the, the thing that helped the most for me on that first team, I was the youngest, but I had a good amount of veterans, right? Peter, like I said, Peter Hudna, Jeff Nesmith. I had Mark Gamet. We had Nick Ellis in the goal. So I had a lot of help and my job could just be to really score. So I came in as that kid who there was centers, there was defenders, there was places all, you know, position wise, we were pretty balanced. And so I, it, it was the role that I needed to do, which was for us to win, which was score goals. Uh, second, you know, second year at Stanford, definitely lost some players here and there. And now that role changed and evolved to, okay, hey, now I have to earn a little bit more ejections. I have to take on more of a defensive role. And my last two years was, I think where I played my best water polo, I don't think our team was near being in that double overtime final every year and losing, unfortunately. But I think that's what spurred the coaches to choose me my last two years as a Catino Award winner, really, because that those two years, I was the epitome of that award, which was offense, defense, assists, steals, whatever it took for us to get to the finals. 
you came into college obviously with a with a large reputation, right? You had played in Olympic games. You had been considered one of the, one of the best high school players uh, in in the country. What sort of pressure was on you to to kind of be be that guy that people thought you'd be? And then as you're as you're succeeding, right? I can only imagine people are are targeting you even more from a from a defensive end, from an offensive end. I think that perfect mix of confidence and humility make the difference of these athletes. And for me, I wasn't that kid who showed up and was like, I need the ball. And I've played with lots of people who have that mindset that that's what their job is to score and they need a ball and they need to play for them. My job was to train as hard as I can and figure out what role that I needed to take on on the team. And because of that, it was a really easy transition on every team I played for because they knew this guy's going to work harder than all of us. If, if, if I'm open, he's going to give me the ball, right? If we need him to help on defense, he'll do that. And because I was able to kind of go into every practice with the mindset of like, Hey, what can I do to help you? What do you think we can do to get better as a team? Talk about it. You, you stop thinking of the pressure, right? You stop thinking of the future. I thought of now, now, how can I make that player better and that player better and our goalie better because that'll help me to win the championship that I ultimately want to win. And I think that's something that I stuck through life, you know, and yeah, you're guarded more and you're, you're, you know, but when you're guarded more, then there's someone else open. And if you can figure out how to open them up, someone goes back and now I get to get my shot off again. So I think that's it. You got to think right in the moment, what's happening, what can I do now? And then all the accolades, when they come, you weren't even expecting them, which I really wasn't right. I would have never said, yeah, I'm going to win four Catino awards. In the grand scheme of water polo, what did it mean to you then? What does it mean to you now to have that honor based off of uh, the coach Picatino? This is our highest, our highest honor, really, in in college, right? This is this is what you you know strive the Heisman in water polo, and forever for whoever wins this, this is something you'll have for the rest of your life. You know, I have the four trophies: ones at Stanford, threes at my house, um, but just being able to say that every coach believed that you were the most valuable player to your team. That's, that's what you want. That's what you want in life. You want to be someone to look at you and say, man, you're everything about this family, about this organization, about this team. And in a team sport like water polo, this is the epitome of the award. And now let's hear from our finalists. Earlier this week, I got a chance to check in with our nominees ahead of this evening's festivities. And we start first with Maddie Musselman, a two-time Olympic gold medalist. She returned to Westwood after two years away to train with Team USA ahead of Tokyo. Did not miss a beat. MPSF Player of the Year and helped the Bruins get back to the NCAA tournament. Let's hear what Maddie had to say on her final year as a Bruin. You like McKenzie and Tilly, really, all had this experience of having to go train away from your college team and then kind of come back. What was that process like to try and become a Bruin again after all that time away? One more. It was exciting, I think, especially being away from a team. Uh, I think you always realize how much you're going to miss it. Um, And I think I I watched the team from afar during COVID, during the Olympic year, and just kind of was itching to get back. And uh, just coming back to the UCLA campus in the first place is always just Always exciting um, just to be back in an atmosphere that, um, you know, had been there for three years. Um, and now come back to a new team, to a new group. Uh, oh. It definitely was very thrilling and exciting. And I definitely came in with a, a really open mind and was really excited and happy with how things went. So I know you often get asked about your play at the Olympic team level. And people often assume, well, if you play at the Olympics or World Championships, you, you bring this high caliber play back to your college game and everyone benefits. But I'm curious the reverse, like how did all those years at UCLA, whether it was something tactical, you talked about leadership, how did that make you a better water polo player for your time at UCLA and and with Team USA? So many things, honestly. I think my freshman year was a a new space. Um, Obviously coming, like I went from high school Olympics back to college, so I never even knew what college was like. And uh, just so many different styles of play to go up against. And I think it, it's, it's very creative. Like, I feel like it forces you to, to do different things against different teams, obviously, which is the same with the national team, but um, you're playing at a, at a different pace. And like playing at a different pace is definitely different because it forces you to like kind of go back to the fundamentals of things and uh, to connect with a group that you haven't connected with because it refreshes every year. 
Um, so kind of like that creativity piece is something that I've always really valued when I go back to national team because kind of unleash it um, when you get back to the summer. And, you know, for me, it's always been the little things and with Adam Wright and the system that he's created at UCLA, it's all the little details of, of water polo um, from like schooling to just like little hand movements. And you don't really realize how important those are, like those things are because you don't usually think about them. Um, and I feel like the repetition of those movements have, I've benefited a lot when I come back to the national team of just the way that I move in the water and, I think obviously I got surgery in 2018 um, and used my UCLA year to, to rehab and I came back and um, I was probably the most prepared I'd been um, kind of going into a summer after getting surgery through my um, UCLA experience, like going into that summer of 2019 and it was super exciting. And um, I think that in itself shows kind of how college prepared me for an Olympic level experience and uh, obviously that's very tactical and water polo. Um, but I think if I, if I didn't have that, I, I would definitely be playing a little bit differently, which obviously I, I like the way that I play and, um, it's fun and the way that I move is, um, a little bit different, but I, I appreciate the way that UCLA has kind of prepared me for that. You knew that this was your last season as it was happening as, as you're getting towards the end of the regular season or, you know, going to the postseason. did you have any, like, last moments at UCLA that you were you were at like consciously savoring you know the last practice or the last walk onto the pool deck at speak or anything like that yeah actually it's funny because we with UCLA we we try to treat everything the same that's kind of like our mentality is that no game is you know bigger than the next or the first game you treat the same as the last game and for me it was kind of hard because I obviously this is the end and you know, I walked on the pool deck and Bella Wenzel, who was also a senior with me, uh, we would be like, oh, this is our last Monday. And then it kind of like started building on itself. I was like, oh my gosh, it's like our last Tuesday and last Wednesday. And we kind of like did this countdown just for ourselves. It wasn't something we like shared with the group that much, um, but just something super small to like kind of celebrate the time that we've had at our school. And I, we did a loosen out like right before we left for NC2As and I like kind of was like going really slow because I wanted to just like be in the pool by myself. And I waited until like kind of everyone left and I just did like a couple laps extra. Um, and just kind of was like laying in the middle of the pool because I was like, this is the last time technically that I'm a UCLA Bruin like on the team as a student athlete and like in this pool. So like, I'll just like soak it up. Um, and it was definitely like a really interesting experience. I was like, wow, this is like so crazy how, yes, it's been six years, it's been so long but it's like already over um, and it's, it's come to an end and I'm, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I've, I've loved all the experiences that I've had and I got out and I was like, okay, that, that was it. Um, and it's over and it's, it's weird how fast time flies. Um, even though when you look back, it, it took a while to get there. Um, so definitely that moment for sure. Um, six um, to my mind, for sure. You're the latest in a long list of Bruins to be named a finalist for the Catino Award. You know the history of this, you know, some of your ex-teammates, for example. Uh, when you get that, that information that you're among what are considered the three best players in the country, what's your reaction? It's humbling. Obviously, it's always an honor to be nominated for any award, um, whether it's a team award or an individual award. And you know, as athletes, we strive for excellence. We, we're trying to be the best um, that we can be every single day. And when you get nominated for something that recognizes that, it's obviously a humbling feeling because all the work and the, and the effort that you put into your sport um, is, you know, put out there and, and, and it's recognized. And I'm obviously very honored um, to be one of three that, that gets to be nominated for this award. And, you know, this award obviously in itself values and embodies so many different things that we as athletes try to be every day. And, you know, just to be on that list, you kind of like itch to get there and, and to be there, it's obviously exciting. Um, and I think it just sets a good example for, you know, the future athletes that are gonna come into college to you know, strive to be like those athletes that have won, won the award. Um, you know, I think of like Natalie Benson, you know, Corley Simmons, Courtney Matthewson, all of these amazing athletes that have come through UCLA that I've gotten to look up to that I'm sure I've been nominated for this award and you know, even athletes at other schools that I've won, like Mackenzie Fisher, um, Annika Dries, all of these, you know, Melissa Seidemann players that I've gotten to play with at other colleges, um, you know, with and against. And I think it's just always exciting to be 
in the same room um, with athletes that you play against all the time. And obviously I've been fortunate to play against Tilly um, on the national team level and play with fish um, on the highest level um, and to compete against them all year this year, obviously um, was a fight, but it's something that you want um, when you're competing at a collegiate level. And uh, obviously us three, like, I think it's kind of a really interesting and really cool group to be nominated with. Um, we're all very different players and, I think that's what makes it exciting. Um, and, you know, you want that um, in an award and, you know, representing different different styles of play within the sport. I think that's really cool. If if you were to win the award, do you have an idea of, of what you'd say or how you'd feel about it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's hard because like when I play water polo, I'm not like playing for an award or like playing for an accolade. Like, I think you know me kind of well, like don't really love the attention, um, but, I think it's obviously like, like I said before, it's, it's humbling and it's, it gives you a lot of pride and it's it honestly really motivating too to just even be nominated because it's a lot of effort and time that you put into your sport. And I think for me, I, I'm obviously very thankful for the national team experience, but I'm also really, really thankful for my UCLA experience. And I think I've grown as a person and as a player, um, as a teammate, and I wouldn't have had you know, I wouldn't probably be nominated if it wasn't for the people that I've gone to play with at UCLA and the experience that I've had. And obviously this is a collegiate award. Um, and I'm just, I would probably thank all the people that I've gotten to be with at school um, and just kind of give it to them because, you know, you, you can only be great because of the people around you and the people that push you to be the best version of yourself. And I would have to, to thank all those people um, for that because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am without them. The most dominant team in the world of women's water polo is well represented this year at the Catino Awards. In addition to Maddie Musselman, two-time Olympic gold medalist Mackenzie Fisher is also a finalist for the Catino Awards. I checked in with Fish earlier this week about her last year at Stanford. Already a Catino Award recipient, she shares a special story on the final year on the farm, one that ended in a national championship. So for starters, let's let's talk about what just happened. This this kind of storybook final season at Stanford. Uh, we, we were talking during the game broadcast, but you couldn't script it any better. I think if you if you tried to put together how do I end my final year, you've had a little time now to think about it. What what stands out on the season that just happened? Yeah, I think for me, what stands out is um, we ultimately ended up playing what I thought were our two best games um, in the semifinal and the final, which is not always what always happens, but kind of what you want to happen. So I think we were really stoked on that. I think in the early earlier part of the season, like we had a lot of great players, but we were all coming in from different spots. So like team cohesion wise from like in the pool, I think we were like missing some connections. And so that was something we worked on all season and to kind of see that like um, accumulate into what happens um, in Michigan, that was really exciting for me. And I think just thinking back on the game itself um, and like seeing random clips on Instagram was just like seeing how hard every single player was like going for like the smallest loose balls or I don't know, you could just tell there's a lot of energy and effort and passion from every single player. And that's like what made me the most excited. One of the things that got talked about a lot during the year was you setting records for Stanford and uh, setting the all-time mark, and, and you set it, and then you just blew the doors off, right? So, so now you've put it far away. It's going to be tough for someone to track that down. I know that you're not big on individual records, but when you have that much success on offense and you're able to contribute to your team winning these these many games, are you are you able to kind of frame that record in your mind in a in a way that doesn't make you feel like look at me? Um. I think it's always just a, a testament to like my team also. Um, obviously I love scoring goals. I'm not gonna shy away from that. Like that's something that fires me up a lot. Um, and I think um, it's something I get excited about. Um, not like fist pumping excited, but excited about in my own way. Um, but I think that the way I kind of look at it is I've been really lucky to be on like four super star stellar teams that um, are able to get me the ball when I need the ball. Um, and so that's been really key for me because it's kind of hard to score if, if your teammates can't pass you the ball. And we had some really great like readers of the game, like in, in Jewel and Ryan, um, who would always hit me with some killer passes throughout the entire season. So I think that's kind of what fires me up the most. And like it's almost as much a testament to all the great assisters that I've played with 
um, throughout my time because like without them, it would be impossible for me to score. You talked a bit about the, the national championship in Michigan and you knew going into that game, it was going to be a fight, right? And USC starts off strong. And uh, I I'd kind of talked to you a bit about this in Ann Arbor, but it did just feel like at a certain point, you, you started to really assert yourself. What, what was being talked about in that second half to make sure that this game ends the way you want it to end? Yeah, I think we were just a bit flustered and frantic in, in the first half. We were a little bit surprised by like the physicality of the game. And I think it would have been really easy to make excuses in the first half and like start kind of like spiraling. Um, but I think honestly that 10 minute half was really huge for us because um, we just like all got to, together to sit down as like and talk as a team about like okay this is not going the way we want it but we still have half a game left um, and we can change like the traje trajectory and then similarly like JT came in basically told the same narrative and it helps that like I've already shouted out Jess Steffens already and she said thank you so here's my second shout out to Jess because I actually really thought it was valuable um, and it's something a lot of people say but it's like the value of it can't be understated I guess or overstated and it's just like you never want to look back on one of those games and be like, wow, well, maybe if I had just tried a little bit harder on this counter or if, you know, I hadn't been so upset at this call in this moment that I, like, let it rattle me or things like that. You just don't want to look back and be like, if I had changed this moment, this might have changed the game. And so I think that's kind of what we realized as a collective team is that, like, it was us against everyone else and we were going to make sure that, like, no matter what happens, like, we were at least trying as hard as we could. And I think that, like, I really think that from the first half to the second half, you can just see a whole new team. Maybe it's just like me, but I was like really impressed with how we came out. And that was something I was trying to channel. It was just like, okay, like lay it all out there. You literally have 16 minutes of water pool left. Like how much can you do? Um, so that was kind of my mindset. You, you knew that this journey was coming to a close one way or another, right? If it ended in a title or not, but as you're, as you're getting down towards the end of the season, or maybe it happens in Michigan, is there, is there a time where it kind of dawned on you like, oh, this is the last time I'm going to do this. or this is my last this. Like, was there any moment like that in your mind? Oh, yeah, of course. I was counting down everything. I was like very acutely aware. I was like, oh, this is my last Monday morning practice. Like, oh, this is my last time ever in a weight room, which sounds like an exaggeration. But if you know me, that's probably not an exaggeration. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty acutely aware of that. Um, and I also like last practice at Avery, like all these like last. Um, and I think that kind of honestly put more pressure on the NCAA. Um, no, it's just weird knowing that something is going to be like the last time you play water polo, like, especially for me, I'm a highly competitive person. So like, I did not want to leave on like, a, like with a sour taste in my mouth, that wouldn't have sat well. Um, and I, I just wanted to like, I don't know, like wrap it up with a bow, if that makes sense. Obviously if that didn't happen, I would have dealt with it. But um, I think that kind of put a lot of pressure on the, entire tournament for me and I was like acutely aware of that like in the month leading up to it, I was like okay I have very limited opportunities to play water polo like let's make the most of them. There's uh, been no shortage of expectations on you and the teams you've played on over the last couple of seasons right whether it's got to win gold in the Olympics right got to come back and, and perform well at Stanford then you add an academic stuff when when the celebration happens in Michigan does all that stuff just melt away like when when could you just kind of be like Okay, like we did it. Um, I think like when when Ryan shot that goal on the or shot on the empty cage and we scored and I think we're up three with like a minute. I think that's kind of I didn't allow myself to relax because I'm highly competitive. I'm like they're not allowed to score another game goal, but I think that's when I kind of knew. Um, and I don't I don't know if I have like I yes I've been told I have lack of emotion, but it's just I it's like a combination of relief and excitement. Um. I don't know. I didn't get like too high, but I was definitely excited. And I think the most special part for me was just like seeing like how excited everyone else was on my team. And like Celeste was like crying and it was the cutest thing ever. And like just seeing like all that raw emotion was like kind of what got me most excited, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know, seeing other people um, was really cool for me. And I still don't really think I've realized that I'm not playing water polo anymore. <laughs> so I still don't think it's like it's really hit me even two weeks out. So we're talking here with the Katino Awards uh, to be presented this evening, and you've won this before. It's a it's a select club that wins this twice. But what 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 would an honor like this mean to you to kind of close out your your college water polo career? Um, well, I think 
the coolest for, thing for me about the Katina Award is just, first of all, like to be even nominated at all is really exciting and like a great honor. And second of all, just to like join the club of like looking at who has won this in the past is just like, wow, that's so cool that I can be considered like in the same echelon as them essentially. Um, and so I think that that's the kind of the way I look at it is that like, I'm just excited to be nominated. And if I end up winning the award, um, I don't know, that's even greater, but I just, I mean, Tilly and, and Maddie, um, deserve it equally in my opinion. So I'm just really excited to like celebrate all of our seasons and like all of us as athletes, um, over the course of the night, honestly, that's what I'm most excited about. And then I would be really honored to obviously win the word and it would be a nice way to go out, you could say. <laughs> this year at the Catino Awards, all three finalists on the women's side are Olympians. Maddie Musselman and Mackenzie Fisher for Team USA and Tilly Kearns for Team Australia. We checked in with the powerful two meter force on her year with the Trojans, one that brought the women of Troy all the way back to the NCAA championship game. For starters, uh, a great honor here to be one of the finalists for the Catino Awards. When you hear that you are one of the three women that is in the final mix here, what's your reaction? Um, I was, I guess I was pretty shocked at the start. Uh, it was something that when I was a freshman, I watched Amanda Longman get it. And I didn't really, as an Aussie as well, I didn't really understand what it was. But um, over my time at USC, I came to understand how much of an honor it is and how important and the history behind it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled. All the finalists this year had kind of the same experience where they took time off to train for the Tokyo Olympics and then they came back to school. And uh, I was asking their finalists this kind of same question. But for you, how, how challenging was it to kind of step away from your USC team focus on Tokyo and then try and work your way back into the team? Yeah, well, I think USC set me up perfectly to adjust, to go into the Australian team. I was I was really young and I came over to SC with the intentions of them helping me develop and grow me as a player so I could make the national team. Um, so I think going back and rejoining the Australian team, I felt a lot more experienced. I was more confident in my decision making and understanding the game of water polo. Um, so that that was actually a smooth transition for me, and I'm grateful that USC helped me develop that and get to that point. And then coming back into USC after being away with the Australian team, it was I, I guess it was also pretty easy. I mean, it, they play a lot differently to how we play in Australia. Uh, but nothing had changed too dramatically. So I was able to just slide right back into the program that I came to know so well back in 2019. Um, yeah, it was just more learning how to play with new players and kind of stepping up into a more dominant role in the team, which is what I didn't have in my freshman year. But aside from that, not much changed going back into it. So this past season, and I know we're only talking a couple of weeks ago is when it ended, but uh, you, you get to that final game, which is where every team wants to be. I know it didn't it didn't go the way of the Trojans, but what what do you take away from this from this past season with USC? What are the big standout moments for you? Yeah, when when reflecting back onto a season, it's easy to think about that last game, the championship game, and when you lose, uh, sorry, when you win, it's all well and good. But yeah, when you lose, it's easy to wipe that whole season and just think about that loss. But honestly, when I think about the season, I think about the girls and the team and how much of a family we were in a unit and I guess all the memories that we built there but also the foundations that we built to build on again next season because we don't lose too many players. Um, the, the loss was definitely hard but I think personally I take more away from the season of what we built than just that last game getting to that last game and being that close, how much does that inspire you to try and change the outcome next year? Yeah, well, it's twice now that Stanford have got me and my team in the final. So the fire, I thought I had a fire in my belly that last game, but that's nothing compared to the one that I'm going to have next season. I'm, I'm sick of losing to Stanford. So I know there's some Stanford people out there listening, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty keen to meet up with them again. You play that two-meter role for USC. They've had some really talented players in that spot over the last 20 years or so, some that have won Catino Awards and the Academy Craig for one. What what sort of um, expectation is there to play center at USC? 
Uh, I think it's the expectation more that I just put on myself. Cammy Craig is someone that I've looked up to my whole water polo life. And yeah, I, the one thing I think in practice is that I want to snap to the ball like Cammy does because she did it like no other. So if, I mean, again, that's why I chose USC because I knew that if they could build and develop someone like Cammy Craig, they could do the same for me. So that's in my goal the entire time. And I know that's in my mind the entire time. And I know we've got the staff that can help me get there. So, yeah, Cammy is always my goal. I, I want to be like her. But it's also the guards, like Hannah Buckling, who was in my Australian team, um, who went to Tokyo. She's a big role model for me. And just the fact that she went to SC and they developed her to be one of the best centre-backs in the world. You know, they the, the coaching staff have got the ability to, to develop these world-class players. And I have full trust that they're going to, They've helped me get this far and I'm going to keep going upwards from here. Yeah. What, what is the next goal for you? Obviously you want to beat Stanford. We know that in a national championship, but is, is there something else that you have out there in water polo you want to accomplish? Yeah. I honestly love the sport so much. I want to stay in it as long as I can and go to a couple more Olympics, hopefully get some silverware <laughs> under my belt. Um, beating Stanford. Yep. That's, that's up there. But I think as playing in the Australian team and building this legacy is the forefront for me, building such a strong legacy and, you know, inspiring the future generation, bringing home some medals for Australia. That's, that's my focus right now. You were talking about how you went to USC with the hopes that they would help get you in a spot to become an Olympian. So if, if you think back to when you found out you were making the Olympic roster, what, what came to mind when you thought of the, the work you did in Los Angeles? just pride, pride, I guess that's, that's the only way to put it. Um, I, I knew that I had a whole team of people on the other side of the world that were behind me and excited for me. And the girls, despite not seeing them for a couple of years because of COVID, they were the first on the phone to me to congratulate me. Um, yeah, it was just, it was special. And I, I was excited to be able to go back to USC and, show them how much I developed and how much I've improved and, you know, come back and to be a key player in at USC and to, you know, help build the team around me because now I was in that position to do so. Um, but yeah, just make them proud. Even though I'm wearing different colors, I'm in different, different side of the world. Um, I just wanted to show them what I could do. And last thing for you, you've talked about what it means to be nominated. If, if this were to go your way and you were to win the Catino Award, have you let yourself think about what that would mean to you and to your USC team? Um, I haven't. I haven't let myself think about it too much. I mean, it. I would have preferred the Natty over the Catino Award, sure. honestly. <laughs> so I don't know. It's it's great to have under my belt, but honestly, it's just the it's for the team for me. I want I want our team to succeed. I want us to win next season this is great it's it's you know it's great for the confidence it's really it shows that my hard work has been paying off but ultimately yeah i i want that natty and now we turn to our men's finalists and we start first with our returning Catino award winner nicholas savlich from ucla the outstanding attacker from montenegro once again got ucla deep into the postseason and he was a powerful offensive piece of a well-balanced bruin squad we checked in with Nicholas earlier this week about his latest campaign in Westwood. So you were last year's winner. Now you come into another season in Westwood to lead the Bruins. But, but tell me what it, what it meant to you to win the Catino Award a year ago. You know, it was, it, was, uh, it was an amazing achievement. I'm very grateful, you know, for the opportunity to join such a legacy of Peter J. Coutinho Award uh, winners. So many internationals, so many uh, players from all around the world. You know, just being being able. Recently, I was I was talking to Jimmy Dunias. He played at the, at the USC, and I believe he was a 2013 or 14 winner. He was mm -hmm. like, "Oh yeah, I know, I saw." Because on the Wikipedia now, the the names are updated. So it's just you know, it's great to be to be able to be next to all these names, and it's a it's a highlight. It's a highlight of my of my of my uh, Division One collegiate uh, water polo career. So definitely grateful for that. You mentioned that you're playing professional now since you left UCLA. And how do you think your time in the in the college game helped prepare you to play at that professional level? 
after the NCAA's and after I finished with uh, with the Masters at UCLA, I I came here to Athens, Greece, to play for Ethnikos. And um, yeah, we just finished we just finished the season, and I was I was evaluating everything that happened. And you know, last it, it's actually a great question because something something I wasn't paying as much attention on was a mental game that I learned so much with uh, with Mr. Lenny Beersma that was helping me throughout my time, and as well as Adam, Adam Wright, Jason Fallitz, and uh, Grover, they were emphasizing how important this is, you know, to remain calm and composed in like big moments in the game. And not only water polo, but in, in every single sport, but water polo specifically, because, you know, we're in the water, you can't really hear. It's like sun in your eyes, so many factors that can put you away from your best performance. With, with as far as like breathing patterns, you know, meditating, getting re- like mind, not only body, but mind getting ready for these games. So you stay calm. So you're not making impulsive decisions. This is something that I learned about as well as mental health while I was while I was competing at the highest level in, in, in college. So I was able to use all the resources that UCLA was providing to me, you know, and just elevate both of my mental and physical game. And I, I, I just built it, uh, such a good such a good working habits that I was just able to move on a different continent, different city. So nothing really, nothing really, nothing really changed. As Adam Wright always says, it's consistency, it's consistent mentality, and that's something I learned and I will keep with me for the rest of my life. Uh, you look at this team that you played on in your last season, and when we look at the stats, I think sometimes you expect a Catino Award finalist to have. 70 goals or just a lot of scoring or, or a lot of saves if you're a goalie, that sort of thing. The, the team you played on was so well balanced, right? You, you were one of many guys that had 30 goals, 20 goals. I think there was something like 15 guys that scored at least 10 goals on this team in UCLA in your, in your last year. Uh, what, what was it like to kind of be, be a leader on a team that was so talented and so deep? That's a very, very good question because I, I personally believe not one individual is more important than team, and it was it was an it was amazing having you know six players in in the water at the same time they can shoot, but not only that, but they they know how to play with each other, you know. So obviously, after playing for five years, and uh, you know, I have a, have this offensive offensive uh, mentality, you know, to score and to shoot, and by that time, everyone everyone knew the way I was playing. So this is. This is where I where I matured enough that I'm not wasting a lot of balls just shooting uh, and getting getting counter on. So I was more composed, waiting for the perfect, you know, conserving shots, reading reading the game, giving the ball to the center, or just getting the players on me and then pass or reverse to the other side and then the posts open. You know, this this is something that comes with the repetition and that comes comes within a game but you know it's it's been a, it's been an honor to learn first as a freshman in 2017 from the guys like Max Irving, Alex Rosa, Matt Farmer you know to come all the way to being like a, being a fifth year and then having guys that are like 17, 18, 19, 20 on my team and I'm just 23 I feel like a grandpa you know in the on the team so this is where you do have to balance everything that you learned so far in your career so it's been it's been it's been a great journey and i'm super super proud of the guys and i know they will they will kill it this year that's that's a lot of exciting stuff and you know however this award turns out you've already done some amazing things on the the academic front and of course in the water polo pool uh the last thing i ask you about because you are a returning winner it's one thing to be a Catino Award winner. It's another even even more exclusive company to have won this award twice. You, you think about some of the people that have done it. Uh, Tony Azevedo, of course, the record that I don't think anyone will ever beat, winning it four times in a row. But there, there, there have been some repeat winners. If, if you're to win it a second time, what, you know, what does that mean to you and your, and your water polo career? I mean, it's, it, it's nice to be. It's very nice and greatly appreciated to be – to be a nominee and to be, you know, to be rewarded with such a thing. I, I, I also want to bring up that Ben Halleck won uh, two or three times this uh, this award and many, many other players. But, you know, even whoever, whoever, whoever wins out of these three nominees, I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's well deserved. I mean, Papa Nicolau had an amazing, amazing season winning, winning an NCAA champ, uh, championship. So I'm extremely, I'm extremely happy for him because I, I know how hard 
he's been uh, he's been working and finally everything paid off for him so um, I, I, I don't want to I don't want to give um, someone you know a head start or something but whoever 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 wins it's well it's well deserved uh, I'm glad I, I put my name out there before before graduating on this Wikipedia link so at, at this at this point I'm just I'm just very 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 happy to go because I'll be flying out from Greece to the Coutinho Award I will be in uh, I will be in person you know to finally meet everyone and uh, just to physically be there. So for me, this is this is really really important. Just to be there because of COVID last year, I didn't get a chance to go out to Olympic Club, you know, and and, and be there because of COVID. But now, you know, just just get to just get to San Francisco. I, I I'm not sure if the rest of the guys will be will be there, but yeah, I'm excited. We have we have Nick we have Nick Porter on board uh, this year because virtually it was me, Merchup and Papa Nicolau last year and you couldn't understand anything what we were saying so at least we have an Australian now you know for entertainment <laughs> purposes too <laughs> so uh, people can actually okay. understand. shout out to Nick Porter yeah. great guy we have to make sure we show goalies some love here at the Catino Awards. Nick Porter for USC, the only keeper among our six finalists, and he continues that amazing pipeline of Australian goalies dominating at USC. We checked in with Nick earlier this week about his season for the men of Troy. T tell me about, about this run at USC for you. You're the, you're the latest in, in what has been this great Australian pipeline, right, to go to USC and play well in goal. What was your experience like for the Trojans? Yeah, look, it was an amazing uh, three and a half years, obviously four seasons in that three and a half years. Um, just the opportunity to come and play for such a prestigious school, um, attend such a prestigious school and, and represent their water polo team was a massive honour, to be honest. Um, yeah, it couldn't have really asked for a better experience, maybe a few more national championships. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, the most important thing was my development as a human being which is something that our coaching staff really stressed that was the most important thing is how you develop as a human being over the four years and and how water polo can can help you develop um and so yeah i, I absolutely loved it i miss it i miss everyone there um but yeah i can look back on it with uh with some pride knowing that um the things we accomplished as a team and what i accomplished as an individual was um was very satisfying you're the latest right in in what has been this trend of of goalies that have gone to USC and then gone on to do some other great things. What sort of expectations do you place on yourself when you're the next guy to go from where you live to go to USC and try and play well? Yeah, look, it's um, it's definitely something that was in the back of my mind the entire time I was there, um, was that, you know, such great names had come before me. So Joel Dennelly and James Clark, and notably both Australian goalkeepers at USC, both have been to at least one Olympic Games. So, you know, I definitely put a bit of pressure on myself to to meet them at that level. Um, you know, they both won more national championships than me, but, um, you know, I'm still quite happy with the way I developed over the four years. And, um, yeah, obviously still trying to chase um, that goal that they fulfilled of being Olympians. Um, so hopefully that's coming up in the future for me. But, um, yeah, it was there was definitely some pressure that I put on myself, but um, I definitely didn't feel any pressure from anyone else to to be like anyone from the past. So that was really good. Let's talk about this last season and for all the seniors, for all the guys that are moving on. Only a select few get to end it the way they would like, right? Winning a championship, but but USC is able to get back to that final, a very strong year. Outside of that last game, not not going the way you would have liked. What are what are your big memories the big takeaways from your final season with the Trojans um just the way we we came together as a team obviously we went into the season knowing that we had a really strong roster um that we were expecting a really big year um from ourselves um but we never really rested on our laurels we didn't really we weren't really satisfied um with how we were playing until we hopefully would have won that national championship game um, so, you know, our daily training environment was very, um, very professional. It was very intense. Um, we were pushing each other a lot um, and our coaching staff were really guiding us in the right direction. Um, unfortunately, like you said, you know, we slipped up at the final step. But, um, you know, as a senior on the team, um, I was really proud of my team and the way we, we developed throughout the season. Um, you know, we never we were never satisfied. We were never happy with 
with you know winning games week in week out we we always had our focus on that last game that national championship game but um you know as, as it panned out it wasn't meant to be um but yeah I'm, I'm honestly really proud of my team and um yeah i wish them all the best for this season it's looking like another big year for them i'm sure in that in that moment after that game is ending you're focused on on that and the result but as as the time has gone by as the months have gone by What's the what's the thing you miss most right now about being a member of the USC water polo team? Um, I, there's definitely a few things, but um, probably the main thing I miss is is the the family, um, because you know we we really place an emphasis on the Trojan family and leaning on your family to support you. And and when I say the Trojan family, I don't just mean my teammates. Um, obviously, they're a big part of it. But it's the coaching staff, the wider university community, um, the parents and friends of the team. Um, it really does feel like a family. Um, and uh, it's definitely something that you don't get Australia or not to the extent that it was that it was emphasized at USC. Um, so, yeah, I really do miss that that aspect of it. And you talk about that kind of family culture. And I think about all the elite colleges that play water polo once you've been in that system and you're and you're known as a Trojan or a Bruin or a bear, whatever it is, it's like you carry it with you the rest of your life. So now, even as a post-college athlete, when you tell someone, you know, you played at USC or you're a Trojan, like what what sort of pride comes to mind when you're able to talk about your experience there? Yeah, when you know, whenever I get asked by someone, you know, um, you know, what's the highlight of your your life, basically, I'll, I'll always say, you know, it would be either that 2018 national championship that we won in my freshman year or or just the entire four years at USC in general. Um, you know, talking about it or even thinking about it, you know, kind of get butterflies in my, in my stomach, to be honest, because it's such a such a proud time of my life and, and you know, such an exciting time of my life. So, yeah, definitely, definitely being labelled a Trojan comes with, you know, an immense pride and, and it's something that I'm, I'm more than happy to to carry on with me for the rest of my life. Let's talk about how you think you got better as a player from your first year to now. If you were to go back and watch, watch film of Nick Porter in, in year one and watch what you just did this past season, how, how do you think you've improved? What did, what did USC give to you from a purely water polo standpoint as far as you getting better as a player? Um, I think for me personally, the main thing that I sort of um, developed over the four years and, this may come as a surprise to some people, but honestly, it was my confidence in myself. Um, so when I go and watch film from my first season at USC, um, I would say that I was a little bit timid. Um, I, I wasn't, um, you know, wasn't as expressive in the goals as I was sort of my last couple of years, especially um, because um, that's just the nature of, of being an athlete in Australia, I guess. It comes with a certain degree of humility. And then when you come to the US, you have this opportunity to kind of flourish and kind of find what makes you comfortable. And I kind of found that me expressing my emotions in the cage, you know, either making a save and getting really excited about it or, you know, obviously being disappointed when I concede a goal. Um, I definitely found that I was able to be comfortable in myself and, and my ability and, um, and express that um, at, at really any opportunity I could. Now you're a finalist for the Catino Award. This is this is the highest honor in the college game. However, it turns out at the Olympic Club, and we'll find out later on today as we're talking uh, prior to the event, but we'll find out uh, this evening as far as our viewers are concerned as to who will win. Just to be nominated, what does that mean to you and the USC program? Yeah, look, for me personally, it's a massive honor. Um, you know, something I wasn't really expecting, to be honest. Um, you know, I was I was satisfied with how I played last season and a um, bit disappointed with how I played in the final. Um, so I was a bit surprised that, you know, I was nominated as a finalist. But like I said, just massively honoured. Um, the other two finalists on the men's side, um, Piper and Savalich, both like unreal players. Uh, as a goalie, they gave me, they gave me nightmares over the, over the years that we played against each other. So just to be named alongside them is... Um, yeah, massive honour. Um, but also, you know, I felt there were probably a, a couple of guys on, on my team that were probably unlucky to miss out on a nomination because, you know, we, we do stress at USC that it is a team a team effort. You know, we all get each other to where we, we want to be. 
Um, so yeah, I'm I'm massively honoured, but also quite humbled to be um, to be nominated because I know there is a lot of guys that uh, probably also deserve to shout. So yeah. And and then do you let yourself think about a what if 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 this were to bounce your way and you were to be the Casino Award winner? Where does that rank among among other things you've been able to accomplish thus far in your water polo journey? Yeah, I think as far as individual awards go, it would be be the pinnacle for me um, to think that I'm definitely more of a uh, a team player. So team, you know, accomplishments definitely do mean a lot to me. But like you mentioned, this is the most prestigious individual award in college water polo. So if it was to swing my way again, be ma- you know massively honoured, but uh, very thankful to to everyone who's helped me get to get to that position. Um, if it if it comes to be. Well, no matter what tonight, someone named Nick is winning this award. So uh, we got <laughs> Very that covered. True. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey. absolutely. Uh, Nick Porter, thank, thanks so much for the time. Uh, appreciate you joining us and uh, best luck with Team Australia and everything else moving forward. Thank you very much, Greg. And I uh, just want to say a massive thank you to the uh, Olympic Club for hosting tonight's event. Apologies, I can't be there. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a great night. And uh, once again, congratulations to all the rest of the finalists. Last but not least, we talked the big man from Cal, Nikolaus Papanikolaou. A finalist for the Catino Award last year, he had an amazing season this year for the Bears. MPSF Player of the Year and led the Cal squad to the national championship, their first title since 2016. We checked in with the man they call Papa earlier this week. What does it mean to you and your teammates to be recognized again as one of the best players in the college game? So yeah, it's a uh, it's a great honor for me, obviously, to be nominated, you know, uh, for a second year, and uh, I wouldn't be able to do it without the help of my teammates. Uh, you know, I I had the luck to have I have the luck to have such great teammates. You know, last year, all of us it was a team effort that uh, you know we reached the NCAA final and we won the the trophy at the end. I wouldn't be able to be here without them, um, and it's super important. And I have their their support and it's so important to me you know i can't thank them enough you're you're the latest great center for cal you you know you go back through the decades and as of late there's been great guys from greece right but it's been guys from all over the place that have played well at two meters in berkeley do you have a a sense of responsibility to play that position well given what has happened before you yeah, for sure. When I first came here, like before me was uh, Odi, Odysseus uh, Masmanidis, who like I knew him from back, back in Greece when I was younger and I watched him play. Uh, he was an amazing player. And um, of course, coming here and like get to, I got to play in his position after him. I know I knew I had to, you know, step up my game a little bit so I can meet, uh, you know, the requirements of, of playing like a center for Cal because having a, a center like Odysseus before, you know, it, there are high standards and people are expecting same things or similar things as, you know, the past center. And I'm pretty sure Kerek expected like similar things, you know, to provide the same help for the team. And, uh, you know, I'm, I was just trying to do my best and help the team as much as I could. Let's talk about last season. So you get towards the end of the season and you go to the MPSF tournament and it's not, it's not going the way that Cal would like. But you get to the NCAA tournament and things totally turn around. How did this team stick together and and rally after some tough defeats at MPSF to then go on and win a national championship? I would say it's all about uh, what I mentioned earlier. It's about the atmosphere that we created in the team. We 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 came so much closer compared to other years. We became like a family, and um, you know after two critical losses against Stanford and uh, USC at the MPSF, we managed to get ourselves back up. And, you know, we, we knew that we're going to NCAAs as, I think, a second seed. And uh, we, we knew it's, it's only literally one game, like against uh, UCLA in the semifinal. And uh, we just said to ourselves that we have what it takes to win that game. And, um, yeah, I guess, like... It, it, it was like pretty impressive how the team was was not impacted by that by those two losses at all in the MPSF because I, I was playing in the semifinal or we were practicing before the NCAA's and nobody like everybody had the feeling that this team is gonna go well and uh, we had uh, we trusted each other uh, and we knew that if we played the way we can play 
it doesn't matter that we lost the last two games. We can we can eventually like uh, win both of the games in the SWAs and actually you know win the ring. If you look back at those two games, if you're a fan of the Cal Bears, you were probably sweating bullets, right? The semifinal goes to overtime. The championship comes down to the very end, a late goal to win it. What's what's your big memory of, of just two exciting wins and getting a chance to celebrate in the pool in L.A.? I would have to go with uh, with the block against USC at the last second. It was, uh, it was an amazing feeling um, because I knew that the club – the clock was running down uh, at the beginning was like five seconds at the beginning of the timeout and i knew like by the time i felt the ball in my hand like the time should have run run out and i was just i'm ready to celebrate but I, if you see the video i'm looking around to see the clock to make sure it's zero and i went as soon as i see zero like the, this feeling is like you know i'll never forget that feeling i just you know i just saw adrian weinberg in the cage and i just you know hugged him or like yeah, it's, it's a great feeling, you know, because you get to win the championship with uh, like your best friends. And uh, yeah, I'll never forget that feeling. And for sure, it's the most memorable, memorable thing from uh, those two games for me. Uh, we've talked in the past about what it means to be nominated for this award, but coming from Cal, right, given given Catino's history there and his legendary run as the head coach. As you're up for it again, have you, have you thought about what it might mean if you're to win this award and kind of add it all together, right? The championship and now the Catino award, it's for a college player, you can't, you can't ask for a better year. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, just Kirk, Kirk Everest, uh, our coach always uh, talks about, uh, you know, Coutinho as a, as a coach and uh, for sure coming for Cal, like it's, it's, it's so special, like, like so like extra special to be nominated and uh, it's a great honor. Uh, because it it means so much to the program, um, and because it, it's dedicated to, to to a coach like that that had such a big impact, not only to Cal, uh, to Cal but on like USA water polo, like it's it's super important for me. And uh, you know, I get to meet all those alumni that I keep on hearing stories about him as a coach, and you know, earlier as like a player, but but yeah, it's it's a it's a great feeling, and again, it's a great honor for me, and I. You know, I just, um, as you said, it's it was an amazing year and uh, being nominated again, uh, coming from Cal and uh, representing Cal in such a prestigious award is, uh, it's uh, super significant for me. Well, however it turns out uh, at, at this year's Catino Awards, you know that you're coming back next year and you have the added bonus, Cal gets a chance to host the NCAA championship this December what do you do for an encore? How do you how do you top what just went on in 2021? Uh, I just I just really believe what I, what I, I have been talking with my teammates and uh, uh, all I, I I just say that it's very difficult to stay on top. Okay, we know how difficult it was to to get there, but it's so difficult to stay there because everybody like you, we have a target on our backs. Every team we play next year, they're gonna. We are the team to beat, and uh, it just comes comes down to the mentality and the mindset we're gonna have as a team. Um, and yeah, like the ultimate goal is, you know, for a back-to-back -back championship at home. It's uh, you know, it's something that we're all looking forward play play at Cal, and um, you know, it, it's gonna be interesting to see how we're gonna play like as a favorite as the favorite this year because last year we might we had a very good team but we might not have been the favorite um but yeah it's gonna be very interesting to see and uh, i can't wait to get back in the pool with those guys and start preparing for it so a big thanks to all of our nominees for talking to us this week ahead of tonight's festivities. If you're just joining us, Greg Meskel here from the Olympic Club in San Francisco, taking you up to the start of our live presentation of the highest honor in college water polo. We've got six amazing finalists. Nick Porter, Nikolaus Papa Nikolaou, Nicholas Savalich. If your name's Nicholas, you're in good shape for this men's award. On the women's side, Mackenzie Fisher, Maddie Musselman, Tilly Kearns. Two athletes tonight will earn the Catino Award honor as college water polo's best player. If you're new to the Catino Awards, it's similar to awards from other sports you may have already heard of. The Heisman Trophy in football, Hobie Baker in hockey, Herman in soccer. 
How does it get decided? It's voted on by the coaches and the gender they coach, plus votes from previous award winners. So now we're just moments away from our live broadcast where we'll find out who will win this year's Catino Award. Two athletes named the best in the game of college water polo. With that, let's send it off to our master of ceremonies, the 1984 Olympic silver medalist, and a man I'm confident would have been a Catino Award winner had they had that honor back then, Chris Dorst. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could all find your seats.
Okay, folks, let's get this party started, shall we? Thank you all for uh, finding your seats. This, this is the problem with getting a bunch of water polo players together and serving them at least one beer. It, it just... Social hour turns into God knows what. Uh, he's, he's done the voice of God. If you want to start that up, that'd be great. Thank you. Ah uh, yes, the time-honored uh, high-tech way of getting everybody to quiet down. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being here tonight. Welcome, welcome, welcome. On behalf of the Olympic Club of San Francisco, welcome to the 23rd annual Peter J. Catino Awards. I, after the last couple of years, it is worth a round of applause. Thank you. It is so great to see everybody in person again. We've got folks from USA Water Polo on the web stream. Hello, USA Water Polo. Greg, you're having a great time by yourself. You should be here, okay? I'm going to talk to you about this in a couple of weeks. I'm Chris Dorst. I'll be your host for this evening again. I don't know why I keep getting invited back, but it still happens. For over two decades, this has been a place where the water polo family can come together and just celebrate. Folks from north, south, uh, competitors, administrators, even referees, we have a great time when we get together, as befitted the fact that we're starting 15 minutes late and the folks on the web stream are angry with us. That and the fact we've only rented the room till 10 o'clock tonight, after which we have to pay overtime charges. A past list of Catino Award winners are in your dinner, uh, your little pamphlet there for dinner, your program. Past speakers are included, having included some people like Peter Uberoth, Don Fisher, Leon Panetta, and Peter Catino himself. It's a privilege for me to be a part of this great, great celebration. And we want to first off thank the Olympic Club, their great athletic director, Nick Luson. Nick, take a bow. <laughs> their extraordinary staff. We need to thank the Catino Award trustees, ladies and gentlemen, because they keep voting money to put this thing on. This is very important for the sport of water polo. Catino trustees are also listed in your program. Please give them a big round of applause. And what a year it has been. On the collegiate front, the, uh, the men's NCAA championship was won by the University of California at Berkeley. Th 13 to 12 over USC, sealed by a goal from Nikos Delagramaticos with 28 seconds left. That's 15 NCAA championships for the Bears. And yes, that is a record. The Stanford women beat USC about a month ago, 10 to 7, for their, their eighth, their eighth uh, title. Uh, Mackenzie Fisher scored a game-high four goals on just six shots. She was the NCAA tournament MVP. She was just named the AWPCA Player of the Year, and she is a Catino Award finalist. So congratulations to both collegiate teams. Internationally, last summer, the, men, uh, the men's national team battled to a sixth place finish. But then there's the USA women's team. They continue to be the best team in the world by a long shot. They won their third straight gold medal by a long shot. This is, I mean, you know, the, 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 the final score of the, uh, of the gold medal game was like a junior varsity semifinal someplace. It was ugly and it was beautiful all at the same time. Uh, good luck to both teams in the uh, FINA World Cup, FINA World Championships coming up in Budapest. Yes, Budapest in June, what a beautiful place. But most significantly, the Men's Olympic Club Open Team, <laughs> I get paid to do this, folks, 
won the Fisher Cup last month. Reestablishing their dominance. And I've been told that their 55 and under team won a gold medal at the senior games a couple of months ago. I actually looked that up and it turns out they were the only 55 and under team. Again. A gold medal is a gold medal, Eric, okay? Just... There were some monumental changes in water polo this year, ladies and gentlemen. We had some major retirements. John Vargas retired from Stanford after 20 years in two NCAA championships. Karen Crawford announced she was stepping down at San Diego State after 24 years. The legendary Jamie Wright, after 40 years at UC Davis, is retiring. My question, why now, Jamie? Yeah. But, but not to be outdone, Denny Harper, a former speaker here at the Olympic Club, 42 years, Russ, at San Diego. Denny retired last year, so let's give them all a big, big hand. Now, folks, the last, last couple of years during the pandemic haven't been easy for any of us, and unfortunately, uh, uh, our water polo family is not an exception to that. Tonight, we honor the memories of seven individuals who were friends, teammates, loved ones. May I call your attention to the video monitors for a video tribute? Brigitte, Kenny, Lori, Larry, Russell, Randy, you will all be missed. I'd like for everyone to join me in a short moment of silence in their, in their honor. Thank you very much. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce a member of the Olympic Club Board of Directors, Mr. Martin Connolly, for some welcoming remarks. Folks, I can tell you how pleased we are here at the Olympic Club to host this this evening. And on behalf of the Board of Directors here, I would like to welcome this, the 23rd edition of the Pete Catino Award. Delighted you're all here. Post-COVID, this, this is great. It's like getting the family back together again. Um, I gotta say, as an Irishman, my knowledge of water polo is very limited. But, <laughs> but Marcus described this award as the Heisman Trophy of water polo. So we are extremely pleased here at the club to host this. Um, I want to pay tribute to our, our athletic director, Nick Lasson. Fabulous job, yep. But also the trustees of this event, uh, Peter Conte, Julius Estick, Morgan Halleck, Colin Mulcahy, and Chris Lathrop. Thank you all. I believe we have um, Mr. Catino's daughter in the house tonight, do we? Yeah. yeah.
Your dad was a giant in the sport of water polo, but both nationally, locally, and here at our beloved Olympic Club. And uh, it is our privilege to honor him each year with this award. So um, on behalf of everybody here tonight, thank you, a sincere welcome to everybody. Thank you to our great staff here tonight. Um, hey, we making this all possible, but guys, enjoy your evening, and this is one award and one tradition that we hope will go on for another hundred years, so. Another hundred years, I'm, we're not going to be here, Anna, okay, I'm just saying, okay. <laughs> My contract runs out in 2050, so. It's, Took him a while to get it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we, we are here to honor the best water polo players in the country, but first we need to recognize some very important people. Uh, Martin stole a little of my thunder. The first family of water polo, the Catino family, typically sit right there. Um, Anna is here, we thank you for that. Louise couldn't make it because she came down with COVID this week at like age 87. Come on, Louise. Mask up and make it happen. Next year we expect to see her right here. But thank you guys for being a big part of this. Without you, this is not nearly as meaningful, so thank you. We, we typically have with us multiple generations of Olympians. I, uh, I'm gonna read off their names, and I'd like them all to stand and remain standing until the end of the applause. If you can hold your applause until everyone is standing, that would be great. And uh, we'll start by Eric Fisher. Mackenzie Fisher. Now, Johnny Hooper. Johnny, are you in the room? You can't hide. J.W. Crumpholds. Jamie Newshall. Adam Wright's in the house. Adam? Maddie Musselman. And Chris Dorst. <laughs> and again, in, in grand, could, oh, um, she came in. And Margie Dingledine Vartani. You know, there, there's some traditions that bear repeating. We have left somebody out every single damn year for 23 years. And God love him, Andy Burke was the one who usually gave me the list, and I could give him a hard time about it, but he's not here, so... Damn it, Peter. It... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and also let us be the first to publicly recognize one of the newest elected members of the USA Water Polo Hall of Fame, Mr. Russell Haffercamp. <laughs> That's a remarkable color of red you're turning, Russ. That's beautiful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, consistent with the theme of celebrating excellence in sports, we have, uh, we're recognizing future champions tonight. We actually have a couple of high school teams here. They're the ones who don't have all the wine bottles on their table, just so you can. Uh, we have the Delisall Boys team, coached by Rob Arroyo. Will you guys please stand up? Th thank you very much. And the SoCal girls team, coached by Ryan Chapat. Can you guys please stand? Thank you very much for being part of our, our organization tonight. And we certainly expect to see you here in the collegiate ranks in a couple of years. So keep working hard. Ladies and gentlemen, the keynote speaker and the presentation of awards will occur after dinner. Dinner's being served right now. Bon appetit.
Ladies and gentlemen, if we can find our seats, please. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I can't. ladies and gentlemen. Okay, folks, we got to get this uh, show on the road here. I, uh, first things first, I understand that uh, there are a couple of tables in which there are some extra, those little chocolate hockey puck dessert things. If you could pass those to table 1A, we'd be able to take care of things. We want to make sure there's no waste at this event. The Olympic Club believes in whatever, I don't know. And Candace, are you ready to go? Candace Canonica, are we? Okay. Okay. Table 11 is here. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I have the privilege of announcing who tonight's guest speaker is going to be. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Quist graduated from Cal in 2003 and it was part of the last class to have Pete Catina was a coach. He was co-captain of the water polo team and an All-American his senior year. He was also a 14-time swimming All-American, which leads me to think he had way too much time on his hands. Will has been a member of the Olympic Club for the last 20 years. He's a fourth generation member of the club. His grandfather apparently is in the, the Olympic Club Athletic Hall of Fame. Will is currently the managing partner at a company called Slow Ventures, which given some of his swim times would be called ironic. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Quist. So we'll see how this goes. Um, when I first got the call from Kirk asking if I'd speak tonight, I had the same reaction that a lot of you did. What, me, Will? What? I think it's uh, incredibly humbling in a room filled with such water polo resumes that outclass mine dramatically. And there's a number of people in the room here who made that evident in the water when we were all playing to be able to be in front of you guys and speak a little bit here tonight. Um, the goal and the ask was after a few years off to reset a little bit and create a little context for everyone in the room about who was Pete Catino and why is the award for the best water polo player in the nation named after him. Uh, my goal tonight is to quickly and succinctly share that with you. I think a lot of you know me. We'll see if that is actually something that I can accomplish. Um, but I want to, to share my own take on it with all of you. On the surface, it seems to make enough sense. I wrote some of this down to make sure I didn't get it wrong. I mean, his record on the pool deck speaks for itself. Eight NCAA titles in 26 years at Cal, countless Olympians and players of the year, and really became, I think, the ambassador for U.S. water polo internationally, almost throughout his entire career and all of his life. And I think, more importantly, someone who had the respect and admiration of everybody he crossed paths with, whether you played for him or played against him. And I think, if you've ever been on a deck with Pete Catino, the fact that he held on, not just to respect, because he commanded it, the admiration of everybody is one of the ultimate testaments you could ever pay to him. Um, so why is the highest award in the sport named for Pete? Why do the best players get a trophy with his name on it? In part because of those accomplishments, but also because of the work, dedication, love, and maybe most importantly, fundamental appreciation and mastery of the logic behind playing 
it well. Represented everything I knew Pete to be about. And I've come to learn in my life that there is no way you get nominated for an award like this in any realm of life, water polo or otherwise, let alone win the award without holding those same principles and putting them into practice. Well, hear me say it time and time again. There's a lot of ways to make an all-star team, but if you're going to be the all-star on the all-star team, which was, which was what Pete was in life, you need to put all of those in practice. So for a little bit of background, in a very non-religious family, and for those of, in the room who knew my dad can agree it was a non-religious family, um, Pete was a bit of a religious figure in my household. My dad briefly played for Pete at Cal in the 70s, and that time I have stuck with him more than any throughout his life. I can't remember a time when Pete was not a presence in my life in some way, shape, or form. From the countless stories I'd hear from my dad to orbiting around the pool deck as a little kid, following Pete's circles, whether Stanford, Cal, high school pool decks, or otherwise, or being squished between him and Heaston on the bench as a five-year-old during Cal Summer League games. And for those of you really young in the room, there's an entire other lecture to be had on one, Steve Heaston. If you don't know who he is, look him up. An unbelievable character on par with Pete. Um, but also you need to look up the two of them to understand what squished meant. Uh, <laughs> the legend has it, and I, I was hoping Louise Catino would be here tonight because I think she could confirm it, that the two of them once had a weight loss contest that Pete won because Pete only gained six pounds. <laughs> Now, for those of you who never met Pete, you have to really understand what a presence he was. On any measure, he was a big dude. But I couldn't even tell you how large he was. Turns out, throughout life, I turned into a pretty large human being. And I'm sure the stats would say that I, was, I ended up bigger, or at least taller, than Pete did. But in my mind, there's no way that I wasn't dwarfed in his presence in every way. He was a mountain of a man with a perennially bald summit that had an amazing stash and usually equally amazing aviators ringing the summit. He had baseball hands for mitts. Baseball mitts for hands. It's got to be your bowl. <laughs> um, and in a booming voice that he used to his, his advantage with players and refs alike. He deeply, deeply believed in hard work. There are plenty, plenty of stories you can get from guys in the room who played with him, played for him in the 70s and 80s, of marathon practices, endless counterattack drills, and swim sets that only a swim coach, which he was as well at Cal before North Thornton, could come to appreciate. Being fitter than your opponents was table stakes for Pete. He was a disciplinarian. There was one person here I wish was here. I won't name names, but there were great stories about what would happen if you stayed out a little bit too late on a Saturday night or ran into some of Berkeley's finest after a game. And what I heard is it involved 100, 100 flies. And there are multiple people who have done multiple of them. You can ask Buzz. You can ask Buzz for names if you want actual stories. I'm not saying it was Buzz, but I'm not saying it wasn't. Pete was intimidating. Pete, Pete, was, Pete could have been the embodiment of intimidating. He came into a room or a pool deck with a scowl on his face, with his mustache, and it, and it was more than enough. But he also had an amazing habit of carrying a switchblade with him almost everywhere he went. So you have to picture a mountain of a man, a Sicilian man with Sicilian blood, sitting there constantly playing with a knife. And again, these are stories, these ones predate me. These are the stories I grew up with. This is the context I've walked in to water polo with, that he would constantly use it in post-game talks. So now you can imagine, things went well, you beat SC that day, probably not that nerve wracking, but I guarantee you it was not a pep talk after a win at USC. There was something wrong with the game and winning was expected. You can, you can imagine how scary it got if you had lost to Stanford because you had done something dumb. And there's, again, again, no names. He's not here tonight. He wish he could be. But there's one prominent individual who likes to tell the story about how 
he was <laughs> not Carlos. I don't think even Pete would throw a knife at Carlos. That might, that might be another lecture on Carlos versus Pete. Um, no, where, where Pete, playing with his knife, not happy with how his team was responding to the loss, tactfully, without a glance, opened the switchblade, flung it, and plugged it in the grass about three inches in front of his star player's foot. <laughs> Needless to say, he got his attention for the rest of the day. Growing up, these are the things that I assumed had made Pete Pete. This is, this is what I knew, this is what you could tell when you're a five, six, seven year old and you're hearing stories and Bennett Indart's coming over for beers and telling you all about Pete. And, and <laughs> Bennett Indart's trying to give you beers. That was, that was later, but not that much later. I told you this speech was about you, Bennett. <laughs> I don't think so. Pete would want you to take responsibility. Um, That was ad hoc, that was not written. Um, so that's what I knew of Pete, and it, and it made sense to me that he was a legendary coach just on those facts alone. I thought that's what went into it, and I thought that's what produced excellence. By the time I came into my own and my own water polo career, playing for Pete seemed like much more of a myth than anything else. The idea that Pete was actually someone's water polo coach, that he was there every morning, there every afternoon, it was legend, it was folklore. That all changed very quickly between my sophomore and junior year at Cal. When they went through the process of hiring a new coach, Kirk Everest was tapped with the caveat, benefit, unbelievable privilege, that Pete was coming back, but this time as an assistant coach. It was really, it was like for two years we were living in a dream sequence. Now, I mean, it, it really it had to be a dream. Pete Catino coming back as an assistant coach made no sense at all, but it was really one of the most magical moments of my life and when I began to really understand who Pete Catino was. I, I, I think the, having an older Pete riding shotgun with one of his favorite players, I think it was easier to really understand his true, true genius. Outworking the competition, being more disciplined, being tougher, that was all a part of it. Making sure you executed that, that was a part of it. But it was actually just table stakes for Pete being Pete. I came to find it was his IQ, it was his EQ, and it was his curiosity in general, but specifically for the sport of water polo, that made him who he was. He understood how to motivate players better than anyone. And you could tell he had studied it and was deeply passionate about it. After our, we lost our first game to UOP, Kirk's first game ever at Cal, we went up to UOP and got our asses handed to us. No one, not many people remember the room. They had a player named Nick Hepner who was unbelievably talented and decided to go to bed early on Friday night, much to our chagrin. <laughs> he came up, silently stared at all of us, let Kirk say, Kirk say his piece, looked at all of us and said, this one's on you. Kirk and I did our job, I don't know, but can I swear in this room? I probably won't. We did, our, we did our job, you guys fucked it up, you can own it. Yeah. And he walked right out of there. And that was, it, it, I couldn't tell you how perfect that moment was. Our team, who was very close friends and, and close knit, all looked at each other. And from that point on in the season, we understood it was our responsibility. That one moment where Pete took a look at us and explained everything. His psychology was especially effective because he was very funny. I was just telling his daughter, you couldn't have, you, if you had told me when I was a kid that I would think of Pete Catino and do nothing but laugh, I would have said, there's no way, he's too scary. He, he, but, he, but he used it, again, unbelievably well and in a studied and careful fashion. We lost uh, that first year, Kirk's year, we lost the NCAA championship to Tony and crew. We played him five times throughout the season Every goal was a one-goal game. They won, we won, they won, we won. And we lost to them by a goal. Heart, heartbreaking. Attila had a chance with six seconds left. Ugh, heartbreaking game. All, and this, you'll, you'll get it when I say it, that I'm talking about it with this kind of gripping the stand. 
we're heartbroken. We'd just gone through a coaching transition. It'd been a tough couple years, and we were right, right near the mountaintop. And Pete walks in. We're all hangdog and feeling blue. And it's, oh, thank God Pete's coming in. Pete will save the day. Pete will say something. And he quietly gathered all of us, and he looked around, made eye contact with everyone, and said, don't worry. You'll forget about this. Never. Most importantly, I think about when I think about what makes Pete Pete is he was a philosopher who's extremely intelligent. He wanted to understand things from a first principles basis. He wanted to get to the root to it and understand what was right, what was wrong. Not just in water polo, but in life. Whether that be in the sport of water polo, he wanted to know what to do, when, and why. Whether that be conditioning, techniques, or tactics. As a result, he had a litany of seemingly simple suggestions that could turn into massive advantages. And these weren't the result of being around the game for hours and hours and hours, like many great coaches have done. You could tell he wanted to study it. He wanted to understand. He wanted to know what made the game tick. What was different about getting your hips slightly here or there? What was different about three guys dropping dot, dot, dot? He was genuinely curious to understand it, and he had the IQ to figure it out. Maybe that was a slight change of your chest angle when shooting. Or maybe being slightly higher in the lanes than seemed obvious. Just a half of a yard was the right thing to do. These are all real world examples of what Pete walked into our team, made these small changes, and they stuck with us throughout a season. His pursuit of knowledge and desire to apply it to the best of one's ability is really what I think set him apart. The hard work, the grinding, the dedication were just necessary components to begin to put that curiosity, that intellect, and that understanding to work. Now, I said this at the beginning, but the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that talent and hard work can take you really far. It can get you on the all-star team in all points of life. But if you really want to be the best, you need to go further like Pete did. When I think of my friends in this room who won the award, when I think of my friends that aren't in this room, the people that I know who've reached this level, in retrospect, there was a different level of sacrifice they were willing to make, and more importantly, a different level of interest in understanding how things worked. There was a curiosity that went beyond competition. What were the big and small chess moves? When do you use them, and why? After a lot of reflection, I realized that is what makes the best the best. That is what takes you from being on the all-star team to being the all-star on the all-star team. That is also what made Pete Catino Pete Catino. And that, in my opinion, is why the award for the best male and female water pole player in the nation is named after Pete. That's all I got. For those of us who knew and played for Pete, uh, I think we were all, at some point, part of one of those stairs. You didn't know whether it was going to be a joke or a switchblade thrown at you. So, Now, ladies and gentlemen, apparently we're here to hand out some hardware uh, to help with the presentation of the Peter J. Catino Award. I'd like to bring up uh, a member of the Board of Trustees. One of the finest players ever to play at, in this, at, at, at the Olympic Club, which is, he was telling me about it just earlier. Mr. Peter, Peter Conti, ladies and gentlemen. That's a heck of an introduction. It's certainly undeserved, so. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dorst. <laughs> well. I know. It's really, I like, I like the atmosphere this is. This is, we haven't done this in a couple of years live. This is the first time back in a while. I'm, I'm, I'm overjoyed to see everybody here. Thank you so much for coming. And by the way, a round of applause for you guys for showing up and being here.
Uh, and, and, and maybe another round of applause for Will Quist, who I always knew was funny, but... actually managed to say some incredibly nice things about Pete Catino, which is, uh, uh, it's not hard to say nice things, but it is hard to summarize a man of that stature and that kind of magnitude. So uh, thank you all for coming. Again, uh, we're here at the 23rd annual Peter J. Catino Awards. Uh, and this is the night we honor, as has been stated many times, the best of collegiate water polo, men's and women's. Uh, the trophy is named after the legendary coach himself. Um, and so for those of you here in the room and for those who are online at, with, through USA Water Polo, we hope this is the celebration you've come to expect from the Olympic Club. We've done it a number of years, 23 to be exact, and uh, we actually think this is getting better every time we do it. So um, Mr. Dorsey will just be here for another 23 years at least. So, <laughs> so I, I, I get the honor of getting to hand this thing out, which is, it, it still astounds me that I, I get to be up here. But just a little background before we do that. Uh, the Peter J. Coutinho Award, it was created here at the Olympic Club in 1999. It was a collaboration between the team, the water polo team here, and uh, the board of directors of, of the club. The intent was to inaugurate a major collegiate sports award for water polo, which it has now become, in the words of uh, Peter J. Uberoth, um, the Heisman Trophy for water polo. You've heard that already tonight. Uh, Coach Coutinho was a force in water polo and many young players' lives have been changed by it. I count myself among them. I was at the end of that switchblade once myself. <laughs> and being an Italian guy, uh, I, got, I got a little bit of the Sicilian heat you know, blown back on me. Um, I'm, going to re I'm going to read some of these accomplishments because I don't want to miss anything, and some of them been, have been mentioned by Will, but it's worth pointing out kind of just the litany and the overwhelmingness of Pete's success. He was a 25-year coach at UC Berkeley, the Olympic head coach in 1976. He had many other esteemed positions and achievements. His collegiate teams earned eight national championships, had a 519 to 172 and 10 career record during that tenure. His last team in 1988, they won a school record 33 games on the way to their second straight NC2A title. Uh, Catino coached 68 All-Americans, six Pac-10 and NC2A players of the year, and five Olympians. And as they say, his no-nonsense style was tough, but fair. <laughs> one, of the, one of the best quotes I know about Pete Coutinho um, uh, was from Kirk Everest. Uh, and again, I, this is one of those ones you want to read so you get it captured just perfectly. He taught us that anything worth accomplishing would not come without discomfort. And he was always there to administer the discomfort. <laughs> so uh, we have a brief video in order to introduce the awards. So if you turn to the screens, please. The Olympic Club of San Francisco is one of the oldest athletic clubs in the United States. Founded in 1860, it serves men and women of all ages by enriching their lives through participation in the club's wide range of fitness programs, organized sports, and social activities. At the club, there is a strong tradition of Olympic competition dating back over a century. Since the games of the Third Olympiad, hosted by St. Louis in 1904, Olympic Club members have competed for their home countries bringing home numerous medals, almost half of them gold. With a long and illustrious history in the sport of water polo, dating back to the turn of the 20th century, the Olympic Club is proud to celebrate the sport of water polo by annually recognizing the female and male collegiate water polo players of the year. And it's been said, it's really true, that the greatest names in the history of our sport are here tonight. They truly are. And they are a team and they are a family, and tonight you join the ranks. You know, in sport, sport is something we take too serious, and other times not serious enough. To me, it seems to reflect a noble and notable sentiment that those who sacrifice the most to achieve a goal are the happiest of people. Embracing both the sport of water polo and one of its legends, Peter J. Catino, the Olympic Club formed the Peter J. Catino Award in 2000 celebrating the very best in collegiate water polo. The namesake of this award is one of the winningest coaches in water polo history. Winning 13 U.S. water polo and 8 NCAA championships during his 26-year career as head water polo coach at the University of California at Berkeley. Peter Catino was named NCAA Coach of the Year four times 
and nurtured 68 NCAA All-Americans, six NCAA Players of the Year, and five Olympians. As coach for the Olympic Club, Peter Catino coached over a 12-year span, winning four U.S. Open National Championships, two World Masters titles, and 10 Masters National Championships. Four of his players received U.S. National MVP honors, and eight players would go on to become U.S. Olympians. Respected and admired by his peers for his knowledge of the game and ability to develop, motivate, inspire, and be a role model for his athletes, Peter Catino was inducted into the USA Water Polo Hall of Fame in 1997 and the Olympic Club Hall of Fame in 2007. You know, it's true that the problems of victory are more agreeable than those of defeat, but they are no less difficult. Let me explain it to you. You are, tonight, recipients, you are the champions, to be the champion. The champion becomes the mark, the standard to achieve, to beat. The greatest effort is against the champion. Moral victories are gained against the champion. And if the champion, champion perseveres, then the pressures become that much greater. It is a tough, tough road to hold, but it is as it should be. It is competition, which is the basis of excellence. Well, the award itself is represented right here in front of me. Uh, its design was by Doug Arth, who was an assistant coach uh, at UC Berkeley for quite a while, an All-American and national team member himself. Uh, it remains here in our Hall of Fame room downstairs. You guys were all just having drinks down on the first floor. It's, you can go and see it anytime you like. And these uh, replicas will be awarded to the winners uh, this year, and they can take them home, uh, as well as a trophy for the uh, runners-up as well. Um, oh, getting lost here in my notes here, excuse me. So the award is based upon the success of the individual water polo players as well as their success with their teams. Uh, and the, we have a, uh, an entire uh, committee here, a member committee of the Catino trustees in order to look after this award and make sure it's appropriately uh, administered to. Uh, they've been mentioned already, but I'm going to name them here real quickly as well. And, uh, probably worth standing up as I call your name, uh, just so you can get a quick round of applause. It's a, it's a, it, it's a job that uh, takes a little time, and, uh, but is obviously very worthwhile. So, uh, Ms. Julia Sesnick. <laughs> Mr. Chris Lathrop. <laughs> Ms. Morgan Halleck. <laughs> Mr. Colin Mulcahy. <laughs> the Executive Director and Club's Athletic Director, Nick Luzon. There he is. And myself. So, it, <laughs> so this is the first year that we've really employed the newest technology in order to vote for this trophy. We have used email for the very first time, <laughs> which was bringing ourselves immediately into the 20th century, which was cool. <laughs> we're, th we're thrilled to announce uh, this award winner has uh, it was, it was a more uh, democratic process than ever before, and it should be reminded that the trustees that I just named were here to ensure the uh, validity of the process. We don't actually affect the vote at all. We just, this is voted on by ex-winners and the coaches uh, from across the country. So uh, now it's the time we've all been waiting for, and we're all here, right? Let's have, we can, we, we can clap, that's fine. <laughs> Let's have a look at the women who are up for nomination. Year in and year out, Maddie Musselman has been a dominant force for the UCLA Bruins. Her prodigious style and versatile play make her a standard bearer for her team. Simply put, if you need something done, call on Musselman. After winning gold at the Tokyo Olympics, she returned to Westwood and led her squad with 69 goals, 39 assists, 108 points, and 17 field blocks. She also led the MPSF with 60 sprints won and 46 steals. 
She recorded 20 multiple goal games with a season best six goals and a 13-4 victory over Michigan. Musselman was the backbone of a dynamic UCLA squad. She ended her senior campaign as MPSF Player of the Year alongside all MPSF first team honors. At this point, we're not sure if Mackenzie Fisher knows how to lose. It's just not in her nature. After winning gold at the Tokyo Olympics, she returned to Stanford where she and the Cardinal built another legendary season. During their campaign, Fisher was a constant. 23 multi-goal games led the Cardinal. Moreover, she was ahead of the conference with 83 goals and 130 total points. On February 26th, she made history, surpassing Melissa Seidemann and Lolo Silver as the all-time leading scorer in Cardinal history, and she was just getting started. She took that brilliance into the postseason, where she guided Stanford to their eighth national title in school history, and for her efforts, was named NCAA Tournament Most Valuable Player. She ends her career on the farm as a three-time national champion, a previous Catino Award recipient, and with 288 career goals, she's the best scorer Stanford women's water polo has ever seen. During the 2022 season, Tilly Kearns made one thing clear. She owns the two-meter position. She plays her game with a power and tenacity that propels the USC offense forward. She opened the season with 14 goals scored in three games, four of which came in a victory over eighth-ranked Fresno State. That was just the beginning. Kearns led her team in scoring with 64 goals, the 10th most single-season goals scored by a Trojan in program history. On top of that, she had a knack for manipulating defenses and drawing exclusions. Her year-long performance earned her MPSF All-Tournament, NCAA All-Tournament First Team, and all MPSF First Team honors. And it started in 1999, and to help me give this award out, uh, I'm going to bring Ben Endart up here in order to, who was the commissioner at the time when the award was created. So. Thank you, sir. Well, the winner of this year's Women's Peter J. Catino Award is Mackenzie Fisher. Thank the Olympic Club for putting together such a lovely event and evening. I'm honored to be a part of such a special ceremony named after the legendary Pete Catino. Um, I'm in awe of the group of men and women that have been nominated and won this award previously, so to be able to consider myself one of them is an incredible honor. I also want to congratulate Maddie and Tilly for their incredible seasons that they had. You guys are both fierce competitors and certainly didn't make it easy on me or anyone else this season. Both of you are equally deserving of this award and I have the utmost respect for you. As I look back at the entirety of my water polo career, I couldn't even begin to list every single person who helped me to get where I am today. But I'll still give it my best shot. My first coach was my dad, so basically I hit the jackpot right there. I can't thank you enough for how much time you invested into not only me, but the rest of the Laguna Beach water polo community. I think you've got to be the most qualified volunteer high school assistant coach out there. <laughs> Um, uh, in my high school years, I was fortunate enough to be coached by Ethan D'Amato, who taught me the importance of making your team your second family and also finding the love in what you do. I also owe an enormous thank you to Adam and the rest of the national team staff for seeing my potential at an early age and believing in me when I didn't necessarily believe in myself. As much as I hate to admit it, Adam might have the highest water polo IQ out of anyone I know. <laughs> or maybe I've just been brainwashed for the past eight years. But my growth as a player under him was exponential. 
Finally, I'd like to thank JT, Susan, and Kyle. <laughs> for valuing me as a player first and a water polo player, whoa, sorry. <laughs> for valuing me as a person first and a water polo player second. I've done so much growing up in my time at Stanford, which to be fair was seven whole years. <laughs> but regardless, I feel so prepared for whatever is to come next in my life, largely because of you guys. Uh, I also would not be here today without the unwavering support of my family. Dad, you already got your shout out. Mom, literally all of this would not have been possible without you. You support me full-heartedly on any path I choose to embark on and are always my number one advocate. I also would like to thank my Oma for simply being just undeniably the coolest grandmother on the planet. Um, <laughs> and also my number one role model. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to thank my sister, Aria. I feel so fortunate to have gone through every step of my water polo career with her by my side. First off, because that means I don't ever have to be on a team that plays against her, which would be very unpleasant, as I'm sure many people in this room know. Um, and second, because her passion and loyalty is unmatched by anyone I've ever met, which makes her the best teammate and sister you could ask for. And finally, I'm most thankful for the teammates I've had along the way. Um, Waterpool has introduced me to some of the most wonderful people in my life. And I know for, the fact, for a fact that if I had been in an individual sport, I would not have made it this far. My teammates are quite literally the only ones that could convince me that jumping in the pool at 6.30 a.m. on a Monday morning when it's freezing and raining and 50 degrees outside is something I could even remotely be interested in doing. Um, but in, in all seriousness, all of my favorite memories playing water polo are not actually playing the game itself, but in the in-between moments with my teammates, just messing around and enjoying their company. Not only do teammates make the sport fun, but they've also inspired me and challenged me to become the best version of myself. I think it goes without saying that no individual success can come without a great team, and I've been so fortunate to be on so many great teams. As I close out this chapter in my life, I'm walking away with lifelong friendships and irreplaceable mentors. Waterpool has also given me the grit and confidence to take whatever challenge the next challenge is in life. And yeah, basically, thank you all for this incredible honor and for such a fun evening. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, we have the men's award to give out, so a, a brief video to introduce them. During the 2020 season, Nicholas Savlage experienced a year that most players can only dream about. He built a legendary campaign, won the national championship, and took home the coveted Catino Award. With his teammates behind him, he showed the water polo world what was possible. In 2021, he had only one goal, to lead his team back to glory. And he had the squad to do it. On a team of five players who posted more than 25 goals each and 15 guys in double figures, Savlage led the charge with 33 goals overall. He also held the team's top mark with 20 sprints won and 26 steals. He recorded back-to-back -back games with hat tricks and scored another three in a postseason bout with crosstown rival USC. While the goal of a title came up just short, Savlage did lead his team back to the national championship game and earned all MPSF second team honors. Nick Porter is the definition of an elite goalkeeper, the latest Australian to dominate between the pipes for the men of Troy. His resilience and focus became a mainstay for the Trojans, and in his senior year, he took their defense to new heights. The 2021 season saw him open with seven saves against Laverne and 13 saves in a victory over number 10 Pepperdine. He didn't stop there. At the MPSF tournament, Porter racked up 26 saves against UCLA and top-ranked Cal. Over the course of the season, Porter recorded 195 saves and collected double-digit saves on 12 occasions for USC. His season earned him all MPSF and All-American First Team honors, and he stormed into the USC history books by completing his journey in Los Angeles with the fourth most career saves in program history.
Nikolaus Papa Nikolaou is a tour de force. He is a model of the determination and grit needed to build a championship caliber player, and his 2021 season proved it. Papa Nikolaou led the MPSF with 68 goals, 35 steals, and 112 earned ejections. He scored three goals or more in 12 games with a season high seven goals against number 19 Cal Baptist. The Golden Bear with a golden arm brought his scoring ways into the postseason. Papa scored two goals against UCLA in the semifinals and added two more on his way to a win over USC for the national title. Papa Nicolau, the latest big man from Greece to dominate in Berkeley, ended the 2021 campaign winning MPSF Player of the Year accolades and NCAA Tournament MVP honors. Congratula congratulations to all the nominees, but the men's winner of the Peter Jacatino Award this year, Nicholas Papa Nicolau. Wrong Nikos, but I think you sent a video. Is that right, Nikos sent a video, so <laughs> you need more? <laughs> hey, uh, when you go to a school like Cal, you feel lucky to go to a school like Cal. And then you see Papa play water polo, and you're like, I'm lucky to play with Papa. <laughs> That's all. An unincredible man, scholar, and water polo player. We're blessed to have him as a teammate, brother, and scholar. So thank you, Nikos. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to apologize for not being able to be there in person tonight. Unfortunately, I had some and I'm keeping this. I had to attend back in Greece. I would like to start by thanking the Olympic Club for organizing such an amazing event. Furthermore, I want to congratulate. All Nicholas right, Avalon all right. Well, that's enough for the award. They both were incredible this past season, and it was really fun competing against them. It's a great honor for me to be the Coutinho Award winner. First, I want to thank my family, who despite the thousands of miles that separate us, they still managed to make me feel like they're constantly with me. Next, I want to thank my coaches. Kirk, thank you for giving me the opportunity to play in this team and allowing me to be myself. Jeff, thank you for the countless position drills, jugs and espressos. And thank you to all the Cal Athletic staff that made last season possible. And especially Noah Feynman, our trainer, and Steven Schwartz, our strength coach. My teammates were also a huge part of this success, and unfortunately, I can't mention all of them, but I want to thank them for pushing me to get better every single day. Special thanks to Nikos Lagramarikas, who besides being the captain of the team, he has also been a great friend and roommate, and I know I can always count on him inside and outside of the pool. Lastly, I would like to thank my freshman year roommate, Garrett Dunn, and his parents, Wendy and Steve, for taking me into their home and being my second family throughout my first steps into this incredible journey. Once again, it's a great honor to be the recipient of such a prestigious award. Thank you very much, and as always, Go Bears! Congratulations to all the nominees, and according to my notes, I need to bring up Chris Dorst to wrap up the evening. So, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Dorst. Congratulations again to, uh, to everyone who was nominated, to Maddie, to Tilly, to Mackenzie, and to apparently everybody named Nick in the room. Uh, but seriously, we, you know, for those of us who are fans of water polo, we just love watching you play. We love seeing the impact you have on your teammates. But most of all, and this is coming from a father whose daughters grew up in this room, and ended up playing Division I water polo. I love the impact you have on the next generation. These kids down here, all of a sudden they're going from all league to, hey, maybe I can play at the next level. Maybe I can do this. Maybe if I work hard, this is available to me. So thank you guys for the example that you set for all of us.
And thank you especially to the Olympic Club. They put on a great show, don't they, ladies and gentlemen? This is... Thanks so much to, uh, to Jake and Richard back there for making the sound work reasonably well. Just make sure we don't get too close to the microphone, apparently. That's called a rookie mistake. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that does conclude our formal program for this evening. Next year, first weekend in June, right here, we're going to have the 24th Annual Katina Awards. Drive home safely. God bless. Thank you so much.
Mackenzie, congratulations again. Really nice work this season. Tell me a little bit about what you would attribute some of the success of the season to. Was it all teammates? Was it all individual talent? Uh, where, where, where do you fall down on all this? I think it's definitely a combo of just having great teammates and also great coaches. I think I walked into this year like, kind of not knowing what to expect. Like, I've been gone a while, and it was just like such an incredible group of girls. Like, we talked about it throughout the whole season, but like, it was just amazing how well we all got along and like how focused everyone was and how passionate everyone was. Watching back the final game, it was just like so clear how focused and intent everyone was on, on like the smallest details, which is just like super exciting for me. And I think our coaching staff had our, our backs the whole time, so that was also awesome. It's always a, it's always a pleasure when it happens that way, doesn't it? Yes. yes. How, how, how much does the uh, the Peter Jagatino Award mean to you? Like, you? You've been here a few times. You've uh, it's been in your consciousness at least certainly. Uh, but to win this year, especially coming back after COVID, t tell us about how what, what you know how, what that means to you. Diplomatic as always, I like it. <laughs> Any big plans going forward here that you can, uh, you'd like to share and water polo wise or other? Well, I officially announced my retirement, so <laughs> <laughs> this is my like, last water polo event, probably as a water polo athlete. Hopefully I'll be back as a uh, spectator cheerleader for other I like athletes, it. but um, I think I'm just really excited to kind of like embrace the new chapter of my life um, as a, a quote unquote regular person. So <laughs> that's what I'm I get the sense, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you won't be a stranger to the poolside yourself going forward, even if you're not in the water playing as much. <laughs> yes, no, for sure. I mean, my sister's still on the team. I love all the Stanford girls, so I'll be at Stanford campus next year getting my master's degree, so I'll definitely be around to see my different role. So an award winner, a master's accomplishment. Uh, yeah, you're a slash. We all know. <laughs> well, congratulations again. We're, we're all proud of you. Oh, thank you so much. Of course. Hopefully that went right for you. <laughs> so I'm making it up with a ton of my head.